Hello, my name is Sherry Lead, and I'm an author and life coach. And today I'm going to introduce you to one of my friends, Cindy Benezra. Cindy is a mother of four adult children, a small business owner, and she's an author of her new book, Under the Orange Blossoms. And I'll bring her on right now. Hi. Hi, Cindy. Hi. Hi, Sherry. Hi. And I just mentioned you're an author of a new book called Under the Orange Blossoms. Tell us what is your book about or what type of book is it? Um, well, it's a memoir self-help book and um, it's a, a story about my life and how I went through trauma and the steps that I took to recover from trauma. And is this your first book? This is my first book. Yeah, it's my debut. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. It's exciting. And, yeah, and, and what um, prompted you to want to write this book? Um, well, it's a long story, but I'm going to make it as quick and Reader's Digest version of it. So <laughs> I really wanted to um, write a cookbook. Uh, my daughter and I own an event company. And um, so like my shoes and my recipes, they kind of tell a story of my life. And I thought, well, okay, that's great. So I will go through my recipes, um, give some luxury tips on how to decorate and then also some fabulous dishes for recipes. So I was going through my recipes, which really actually took me almost an entire day because I've been collecting them for so long. And um, I was, as I was going through them, I realized um, that they were taking me through uh, probably, you know, six, seven or whatever it was all the way up until my adult years and I'm close to 60. So that's a lot of recipes and every recipe was a, a memory in a sense, um, an experience. So as I was flipping through them, I got to Mrs. Grill, uh, Mrs. Anderson's grilled cheese sandwich. And I thought, oh, this is funny. Um, so I flipped over the recipe and it said age five. And I wow. thought, oh my gosh, I know what happened to me at age five. That was um, the time that my father sexually abused me and physically abused me, started to. And so I didn't know what to do with that memory. And I journal all the time. So I just, had a few spiral notebooks in front of me. I wrote it down. I wrote that that memory down. And as I was going through my recipes, um, I was filling up five different um, spiral notebooks. Every thought that I just didn't want to keep in my head, I put it in that notebook. And so that notebook had, um, it was uh, on DV, sexual abuse, physical abuse, mental health, um, what else? Um, generational trauma. It also had uh, a lot of thoughts and stories about um, narcissism and oh, suicide. So I had that notebook and it was another notebook. It was filled with decor <laughs> to kind of contrast yeah. decor. Yeah. And then I had another one on um uh, grief and loss because I have a child with special needs and it was grief and loss. And, um, I also had a, um, my favorite one was, uh, just inspirational things that got me through. So what were the tools that I used to heal, to help me go through all those things? And then my final one was decor. And when I looked at all those notebooks, I remember rubbing my hand around them and I thought, okay, which one carries the most weight and which one is the most fun. And I thought, okay, decor and recipes are definitely more fun. <laughs> but what was um, the one that filled me with the most shame, the one that uh, was the most, that had the most weight in it, I thought, okay, it's my sexual abuse history. And I thought that one's the most taboo. People don't talk about this. People don't want to talk about it. It's uncomfortable. Um, it, we talk about all of everything else. I mean, we talk about um, divorce. We talk about yeah. opiates. We talk about um, alcoholism. I mean, and that's all sort of become, and in a sense, our discussions have become commonplace. But when it comes to sexual assault or sexual abuse, that's uncomfortable. And I thought, well, that's just, it's sad. And yeah. I also recognize if, 
if I went through so much tragedy and so much trauma that there probably is a lot of value in, in that. And I have a, I have a lot to share and say about it. So I thought, well, I'm going to, you know what, maybe I won't write that recipe book or that, you know, does how to, what's the little secret sauce in trying to throw a dinner party. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe my story is about sexual assault and what happened in those years and what it is that inspired me to get through. Um, yeah. So, so taking you, so first of all, when, you know, when you started this process by initially wanting to write a re recipe book, how long ago was that? It was five years ago. And, okay. um, the reason it took me so long was writing through trauma. Um, yeah. that was just a, it was horrendous. So, you know, that when you go through any traumatic event, mm -hmm. um, whatever it may be, I don't know, fight with your husband or whatever it may be, you're with your kids, mm -hmm. then you take that, you sort it out and you put it in a little box in your head and you're like, okay, done with like already done mm -hmm. pilot. You know, it's just kind of sorted out. This was, um, writing through trauma was taking all those boxes in my head and I had a lot and taking mm -hmm. all those boxes and opening up the boxes like Pandora box and descriptively writing what that experience was like. And I think when you're writing, as you know, you have to think mm -hmm. about what that feeling is, the color of the room, what did they say? What did you smell? I mean, you go through all the different senses and then descriptively write that. So I became very traumatized by writing this. So I had to write in different stages. And I actually ended up getting a trauma therapist who wrote through trauma. So that was a huge hurdle. And um, what yeah, and I want Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I just want to go back a little bit, because some of the things that you were saying earlier, when you were giving the synopsis of how you got from a recipe book to to writing this incredible book about your personal experience, uh, you mentioned, I, I just want to take a step back a little bit because you mentioned that as you were writing this recipe book, you start to collect these different uh, journals or notebooks that were on different topics, you know, from the sexual abuse to uh, you, to the decor. And you mentioned um, that after, you know, as you were filling these notebooks, you, you realized it sounded like you realized you needed to write something, but what was it going to be? And you mentioned that you, you know, kind of sat with each of these to see how it feels, you know, what brought you joy, what was, you know, what felt like something you needed to write. Um, and so I just wanted to take a step back because you, we, you mentioned that, but I think that's really, uh, you mentioned that but I want to take a step back to, to visit that a little bit more sure. because I think that's that's very important because um, you know I you know I know you as a friend and I I, I would I think of you as this joyful person you know? <laughs> and, and so it doesn't surprise I had no idea about the recipe book story but that doesn't surprise me because you are uh, someone who who just is so great at entertaining friends and, and, you know, bringing, bringing connections together. Uh, so knowing you, I would think in my head, oh, that's just the natural fit for you because that's where, that's a place that I see you the happiest is when you're bringing people together, entertaining people in your home. So for you to, to choose the hardest book, the book mm -hmm. that, you know, where you know that, that this feels very uncomfortable, what, what was it that that got you to that point? I mean, how long did you have to sit there until you decided, okay, yes, I'm going to, I'm committing to this, or was it something really quick where you you just knew that you had to do it? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I think I I knew intuitively. So let's just say this: I've always taken the long road, the harder road. I just know <laughs> that's that's just something that I do. Um, personally, I don't. I don't know why. It's just something that I do. I feel that um, usually the hardest road or the longest road, I seem to get the best gratification from it. So um, that's, I think that was it. And I think that's mm -hmm. how fast that question came up. I just thought, no, this is the harder road. This is something that needs to be done. And this is 
not about my fulfillment, about the joy, you know, the joy part. I just thought this is for somebody. This is to help somebody else. This is, I have so much knowledge in this background and maybe I could be, help somebody, help the girl who I was at that age who didn't know what to do. So maybe it's in a sense it was helping myself. I don't know, but I'd like to believe I'm helping somebody else. And you mentioned that you hired a trauma therapist in this process as, as you're writing, because as you're writing, it did take you back to these, these very painful moments. And right. it sounds like you had to take a step back every once in a while um, to, you know, regroup or, uh, um, to take care of yourself <laughs> as, as you were, you were revisiting these moments. What, at what point in the process did you realize that you needed, um, the support of a trauma therapist? Uh, when I started having flashbacks. So, um, a flashback is, um, uh, it's from post-traumatic stress. It's a post-traumatic stress disorder. And so um, when you have a flashback, it could come back in a memory or it could come back in a, um, it, it's a memory. Mine happened to come through dreams. So it was little fragments of, of a repressed memory. And when you go through trauma, a lot of times your body just, not your body, but your brain doesn't shut down, but it just kind of holds it protects you and holds that, um, shields you from recalling that until you're able to recall it, or maybe it may never happen. Um, but mine happened at, from a trigger. I was 16. I started to become sexually curious. And then also I didn't live with my dad. My dad is my perpetrator and I didn't live with my dad. Um, he would, um, he's a petroleum engineer. And so I lived overseas. So he would come back and forth. And when he came back, I was sexually curious. Then I saw my dad, it was a trigger. And in that trigger, I started having nightmares. And that's when these flashbacks came. And this is pretty common um, from trauma and specifically for sexual abuse victims. It usually happens, um, it can happen like this, but a lot of times it happens when a person has children and they're looking at their own children, reflecting back what their life was like. So um, the stories from what I've heard that this is a pretty common thing where you could step back and kind of look at your child and think like, oh, you know, what was it like for me? And then you, they may have a little fragment or a flashback. Um, a lot of times people don't know what it is. You really think you're going crazy. Mm -hmm. you, like you really truly believe you are going crazy. And when I was 16, I, I thought I was losing my mind. Um, and I didn't have the resources. I was out of the country. So I didn't have, well, we didn't have the internet. <laughs> That's how old I am. So, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, as you were describing that and uh, having these memories come back when you're raising children or, or, um, seeing things differently, maybe as a parent, when you have children and they get to these certain ages and you think of yourself at that age, uh, it reminds me, as you know, we, my husband and I adopted our daughter from China and I'm also adopted from Korea. And I view my adoption differently after raising her and watching her go through different things and recognizing, oh, that's the way I was feeling at that age or, right. You know, I, I I see things differently, and um, so I, I I imagine as parents that makes sense to me as you describe that. You know, when you raise kids, sometimes some of these things come out because you're starting to recognize, oh, this is who I was at that age. Uh, because when you're at that age, going through these things, you're just trying to survive, Absolutely. and um, it's it's hard to really uh, understand it in that survival mode. And when you get older and see your kids that and see how vulnerable they are at that age. Um, or we're I, just I, trying just, to survive parenthood, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's true too. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So, so your dad, you, you mentioned your dad was, um, your perpetrator and after, you know, and he would come back and forth because of his job as an adult, did you have a relationship with him? Um, well, that's, uh, I would say I, had a relationship with, I wouldn't say it was a close relationship. I had lots of boundaries that I established. Um, 
after discovering what had happened and after confronting him, um, I never really cared for him as a person. So it wasn't very difficult for me to do. So I had a lot of boundaries around him. And then growing up, I just continued to establish them. Um, and I told him, I, I shared with him all the time, even though he denied that he uh, um, sexually abused me. So even though he denied it and I kept on asking him questions about it, he would just deny it over and over again. But I would always explain why I wasn't close to him or why I had boundaries, um, even though he was perplexed. Like he goes, well, I don't know why, why you're doing this because this never happened. So it was, um, it was, that even made me feel a little crazy too, because I would always remind him if he did come over, um, and that was way, way into the end, probably until his late seventies when he would really come over to the house for dinner. Um, and he was in a walker at that time. Um, I would always remind him at the door, um, dad, um, you made your choices. So I'm making my choice. And that is that you can only go to the dinner, the dinner table and go to the bathroom and, you know, pretty soon I'll take you home or whatever it may be. But I did have very, very firm boundaries with him. So I guess you could say I did have a relationship. I didn't cut him completely out of my life. When the kids were younger, we just, did, he really didn't have, um, well, he, he was away. So that was another thing too. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, he would come over and, and you would take him home. Did you become his caretaker at some point? I did. Um, oddly enough. Um, I don't know, crazy how things happen. Oddly enough. Um, there was nobody left in his life. Go figure. And, um, I had to, that was a hard time. It was a hard decision for me. Um, I had to just be who I am myself. I, I would help, I would help a, a dog on the, the side of the road. Even if it bit me, mm -hmm. I would help and take that dog to get some care. And, um, I know I'm describing, I mean, it is like my dad did mm -hmm. bite me. He was that dog. And I felt like he's, dying you know he's in his last and final year so i thought yeah i i will help him get medical care i will establish this and i know that's created a lot of controversy in telling my story people were like well why would you ever do that and um but I, that's probably i could go into depth in that but i don't really feel that i have to justify i am just saying that i did it because that i couldn't live with myself if I didn't do it. I think that would have been harder to do just to ignore him and cut him out. So I think I was the only person at the end. Um, and ironically, he was the one who hurt the most. Yeah. That, you know, that's such an interesting perspective that you have that I I haven't, I, and I'll be honest, I, I don't know very much about uh, sexual abuse and um, domestic violence and um, um, and pedophiles other than I did in a previous career I worked as a, a criminal prosecutor and that was my that was my uh, contact with uh, violence against children or sexual abuse against children but I I've never had a friend or someone close to me that now I know I probably have had friends that have gone through this as well but haven't spoken of it. Um, mm -hmm. because it, it is, it, it does put you in this vulnerable place. And I can't imagine um, uh, being able to do that or having the strength to do that. I mean, I, you know, uh, so I imagine I do know more people than I know, because this is not a common topic, as you said, and, and people right. um, are afraid, afraid of having a stigma placed on them. And, Absolutely. you know, uh, and I try to, when I hear these stories, I try to relate it to uh, something in my life. And, you know, there's, I don't have the exact uh, same, same experience. And the only thing I could think of is, is with my experience with breast cancer. And I know a lot of people don't talk about their experience with breast cancer because they don't want the stigma when people look at them to see them as, you know, a cancer victim or to just see them as that. Right. And, I imagine whenever you go through some type of trauma, and especially something that has this uh, stigma of such a taboo topic, that uh, it 
it carries a certain weight that's similar in that a lot of people don't want to be looked at or known as a victim of, of sexual abuse. Um, there's how, so much shame in it. I mean, I think there's just deep, deep rooted levels of shame. And I think for the victim, for the victim. And I think that's a lot of it there. Um, because I think society, cause it's so taboo that I think society places, you know, this, you're right, the stigma and there's shame and it's uncomfortable. And so there's just so much around it, but I do believe, don't you think like if we had more conversations about this, mm -hmm. that, that, taboo or that stigma around it would not be as prevalent as it would be with, um, it would be more common, like talking about um, opiates or, or um, alcoholism or some other social issue, don't you think? Uh, definitely. And I, and it gives, a, it gives people the freedom to get help if they need to, right. when they feel that they can talk about it and, and not be a, a mark against them, the victim. Um, so just you, even you coming, you know, on here and, and all the other, um, different outlets that you're willing to speak on, you know, you never know who, who's listening and that sparks something in them that makes them more comfortable to, to go forward. So, um, Thank you. I, I still want the recipe book, but thank you so much for um, for for writing about about this. And it's I have the book right here. It's such sure. a beautiful book, and it's it's one of these. I started reading it. Um, I was you know I I'm been pretty busy lately, and I was just going to read a little bit and and kind of peruse through before we spoke today, and I couldn't put it down. Oh, thank and you. It, yeah, and it's not just because it's not just because I know you personally. It's because it's the way it's written. It's written in such an authentic voice. It's easy to read. You know, there's not a lot of um, even though the topic as serious as it is, I think anyone could pick this up and read it and have it touch them. Which um, uh, and and also as and it's not just you know not just somebody who who um, has experienced a similar a similar trauma, which uh, I imagine this book would really speak to somebody. But even someone who hasn't, it helps me. When I read it, it helped me understand a little bit more. Like educating. Um, yeah, it helped me me understand just just the complexities. One, and also looking at somebody and not realizing what their their life story is and what they've gone through and what's gotten them, you know, um, what's gotten to them to where they are today. I mean, there's right. just there's so much here in this book that that I think it would uh, it it just it enhances anybody's understanding of of um, difficult families, mm -hmm. um, forgiveness. Uh, trauma and it doesn't even honestly the way it's written it doesn't even have to be uh, sexual trauma no you speak just... to trauma in general and, and I felt that when I when I was reading it uh, so I, I mean it's it's just a beautiful book Cindy thank you honey thank you no I really appreciate that you have good taste <laughs> <laughs> no it is and, and so I usually do audio books so for me to not be able to put down a, a physical book that that really says something so you know, you uh, you talk a little bit about about forgiveness. Um, mm -hmm. How how important do you think? Uh, I'm trying to get how what question to ask, but what role does forgiveness play? I guess in healing. Uh, I think that's a really tricky question, and um, forgiveness. I think just the word forgiveness is. Um, everybody has a different idea what forgiveness is. It could be forgiveness wholeheartedly. It could be of um, an understanding. I mean, it could be whatever your term is for forgiveness. Um, I have to say it, the word itself um, could be said in so many different ways or have so many different meanings. And it doesn't necessarily um, have to be like a religious thing, or it doesn't necessarily for, okay, I'm just going to start all over because it, it's such a complicated, um, discussion for me. Forgiveness was, um, 
forgiving myself, actually, forgiving myself that, um, cause I used to, I don't know, like, woe is me. Like, why did I have to get a dad like this out of it? All the dads, did I have to get a dad like this? Um, and with that, I just thought, okay, well, I done being sorry for myself. And why did I have to, um, I think I, you know, you kind of go into victim role. Did I do something, you know, the whole thing. And when I came down to it, I realized that I had, um, the most, I had to come to terms that, um, I had the power. It wasn't really like the words that he was going to give me. Like he was never going to admit or say the apology that I wanted to hear. And I think I realized that I had the power and I need to forgive myself, just like holding on to things, uh, blaming, and I had to forgive myself to move on. And in that process, it took years and years and years. Um, I realized I could still be mad and um, forgive in a sense. So just kind of like healing or moving away from that pain and, um, I think that's my process of forgiveness. It's yeah. What I what I'm hearing so you hard. And what I'm hearing you say is that you had you got to a place where you moved from um, from being stuck because of your situation and being stuck it, as a victim, for lack of better words, to a place where you realized you 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 had a choice. And um, it was through that choice that you were able to move forward. Like you couldn't change who your dad was. You couldn't make him, uh, you know, you Father couldn't make him. Yeah. Yeah. I do anything I could different. Not make him a pedophile. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't change your experience, but you yeah. had a choice on how you wanted to heal and, and move forward. Um, choice is a good so word, that. Sherry. Yeah. And, you know, and what's really interesting, too, uh, I was looking at your website not too long ago, and you have a YouTube channel. Uh, is it called Cindy Talks? Is that the name of the YouTube channel? Cindy Talks, yeah. Cindy Talks, and in that, you interview your, fa your father. I interview him. Um, it's in three different segments. I interview my dad. And, uh, yeah, and it was probably, I, I can't believe that, um, when I was unfolding and I did a lot of audio recording and when I was unfolding and listening to what he was saying, I thought, gosh, this could be a, a very educational tool on mm -hmm. uh, what a, what a mind side of a pedophile looks like. And it could be very educational in mental health. It could bring awareness to other people because people don't believe that the, these things happen. They feel I, it actually kind of gets me pretty mad when I hear people tell me, oh, that only happens in low-income families, or oh, that only happens in this ethnic group, or oh, that only happens, um, and it just goes on, and I don't know anybody who this has ever happened to. And the statistics are one in four girls and one in six boys, and statistics don't lie. It's That's here in America. It happens mm -hmm. all the time. And uh, it's just staggering. It's almost epidemic, and it's the generations just go on and on and on, and it's an old story and it's just keeps on going. And then it just creates more trauma. Um, it's a really sad state of affairs. It really is. And then even the system of, of going to therapy when you're a child, then the parent could be removed. I mean, there's a lot of broken cogs in this wheel. And I truly believe that if, if more people were really, really aware of and education, you know, on prevention. I think a lot of things could change, but um, that's not going to happen until we talk more about it. Yeah, and um, I will have your YouTube and your website in the description. That YouTube channel, though, I really encourage anyone to go check it out. You also you speak to your dad, which is so unique to to listen to those interviews and to actually to see him. Um, and like you said, you know, there's not a face that matches, you know, there's not a certain type. This is, you know, it, it's, it's, there's not a certain type or a look of a predator. Right. Um, and, but so those, those conversations, uh, that you did that, that is so unique. And then also you have an interview where you and your husband are being interviewed, mm -hmm. um, which, which 
that's another layer that we we're not going to have time to talk to. But the way it really, you know, it affects your relationships as you, um, a person who's who's been through trauma, it affects their relationships or it can, right. and also an interview with your adult children. Yeah, um, that was so, my favorite one. <laughs> yeah, and so so it's it's such a gift that you've not only written this book, but you've also given us a glimpse into your family. I mean, um, that's, that's really special. So thank you for not just writing the book, but also for going above and beyond and, and continuing the discussion and continuing to share so much of your life, which allows other people to connect and, and uh, relate to your story. Well, thank you for having me, Sherry. Seriously, you are yeah. a shining star and so good at what you do continue to do what you do. Yeah, well, I have one last question to ask you before we uh, finish. I always ask for, at the end of these, I always ask for three tools. Okay. Uh, so if you, you know, I, I know looking at your book, you and also in the back of your book, you, you give um, different ideas of what people might want to look into for different therapies, uh, from mantras to, to different types of therapies. But if you had, so I know you have a lot of tools, <laughs> <laughs> if you could just pull out three tools to give to someone for steps that they could start to take towards healing from trauma, what three tools would that those be? Um, I would have to say traditional therapy. Uh, I would start with that. I think that's the most, I found it the most effective. Um, I really liked, um, uh, okay, I would have to say, start with uh, traditional therapy. That is probably um, the most helpful. And uh, there's other things that don't cost money. And that could be um, journaling. It could be simple things to moving your body. When you just move your body, um, it just creates hormones, uh, endorphins that um, just shift that energy. And it it's free. I mean, dancing, that's free. You could just shift that energy. Um, one thing I like about journaling is that it's just, it, you put all your thoughts, it's like a toxic waste zone. You could just put it all on paper. It doesn't have to be long or lengthy. It could be two sentences every day of like a check-in, how you're feeling in the morning, how you're feeling in the evening and rate your day. It just, it's, very therapeutic. You could just start really quickly. Um, breathing exercises. I know you said, Sherry, just a couple, but breathing exercises are great. Um, yoga. Um, it doesn't, you don't need a lot of resources um, to find healing tools. You have it within you. I love that. I love that, especially that last line that you said that you have it within you. Um, I also believe that everyone everyone has the answers inside of them. Sometimes it takes, you know, a moment and journaling is one of my favorite things too. I, I absolutely love journaling um, and looking back at my journals as well. Well, thank you so much, Cindy. And like sure. I said, I'll have in the description, uh, you know, I have quite across the screen that you, know, you can get your book on Amazon, but we'll also have your YouTube um, station that I encourage everyone to watch. And uh, also your, your website and yeah, there's probably a lot of um, your, your Instagram, your social media, uh, we'll have all of it down there. Uh, so I'm sure, you know, if anyone wants to reach out, um, and contact you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Okay. You too, hon. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for joining me this week and join me again next week as we meet another woman from the Friendship Series.